Ever feel like Christmas is full of stress? Decorations to put up, gifts to purchase, parties to attend? It seems like there's a never-ending list of to-dos. But this season can also be filled with its own unique kind of loneliness. Maybe this past year you've lost a family member or a close friend. Or perhaps you find yourself estranged from someone you were once close to. And you look at social media and it seems as though everyone is posting all their special gatherings and you sit at home alone. We look at the world around us, listen to the news, and are overwhelmed with the state we find things in. Over 50 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered what would be his last Christmas Eve sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And he climbed the steps to the pulpit and he said these words, This Christmas season finds us rather bewildered, a bewildered human race. We have neither peace within nor peace without. Everywhere, paralyzing fears harrow people by day and haunt them by night. That sounds like a message that, that could be preached in 2021. Some things have changed, but we still have a long way to go. And yet Jesus came to bring peace on earth and goodwill toward man. Of course, we don't have to look around us to see signs of pain and brokenness. Many of us find ourselves in a tough time, a challenging season. We look within ourselves and we find restlessness in our own hearts, divisions or struggles within us. We feel the longing and the ache for something more, for our lives to be whole. Is peace really possible? A peace that's not the absence of conflict, but the presence of something. Truth, justice, beauty, goodness, wholeness. God's very spirit. Even as we wait to see peace on a political, social, and global level, peace can happen on a personal level. We're going to unpack a portion of the Christmas story and see what peace looks like during crisis, during a difficult situation. Turn in your, your Bible or your device, and let's start at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Now, just a little bit of backstory. The angel Gabriel was sent to Mary in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, were an older couple who longed to have a baby but couldn't. Then Gabriel showed up one day and told them that they would have a baby, but not just any baby, but John the Baptist, who would declare the coming of the Lord. So fast forward six months. Mary, of course, is unaware of this because, well, there was no social media. Mary was engaged to Joseph. Now, Mary was just an ordinary teenage girl. It's estimated that she was probably 14 or 15 at the time. She wasn't a prophet or a priest. She was just a girl living with her parents, preparing to marry Joseph. <clears throat> it's important that we understand engagement and Jewish culture were very different than engagement in our culture. In ancient Jewish marriages, the word engaged or betrothed had a different meaning than today. First, the, the two families would agree to a union and negotiate the betrothal, including a price for the bride that would be paid to the bride's father, and then they would make the public announcement. At that point, the couple was pledged, similar to engagement, but much more binding. Even though they were not officially married, their relationship could only be broken by death or divorce. Sexual relations were not permitted, and during this time, the couple would live separately with their parents. 
in the middle of that ordinary life. Verse 28, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now, let's just pause there for a moment. Sometimes when we've heard a story or we've read something many times, we can just kind of skim over it. Take a moment. Imagine yourself. You're just living your life, working, hanging out with friends, following God, doing the best you can do. And then one day, an angel appears to you and tells you you're favored by God and that he's with you. Well, just the fact of an angel appearing to me would have been enough to shock me. But there were more surprises in store for Mary. Now, I've never had an angel appear to me. You? In fact, I don't know anyone personally, well, other than my husband, but that's a story for another day, that has had an angel visitation. But I can imagine that if I did... I would definitely be freaking out. And the angel greets her with the words, highly favored. That word in the original language is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that's found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. And it says, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear Son. See, it wasn't just the angel's proclamation over Mary. It was God's own words over you. You are highly favored. He has poured out his glorious grace. You may not feel favored today. You may not even feel seen. But can I tell you that the same God who sent Gabriel to a young teenage woman in a small town 2,000 years ago, is the same God who pours out His grace and His favor on us who belong to His dear Son. He sees you today, and He pours out His favor on you. Now, the interesting thing about favor is it doesn't equal unbroken happiness. In fact, if you go forward a chapter, there's a story in Luke chapter 2 about a man named Simeon. And Simeon was a, a man in Jerusalem, and he was righteous and devout, and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. And he would wait in the temple, and he was waiting for the Messiah. And then Mary and Joseph, as the story goes, took the infant Jesus to the temple. Simeon had been waiting for them. And verse 34 of Luke chapter 2, it says, And Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he'll be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. And as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword, he's speaking to Mary, will pierce your very soul. So Mary, who the angel had just proclaimed was favored by God, will also experience great heartache. You know, if Mary had measured God's favor by the presence of happiness, she would have thought the words of the angel to be just an illusion. Friends, just because you are experiencing pain or uncertainty doesn't mean you aren't favored by God. God's favor is not determined by our circumstances. Look at me back at Luke chapter 1, verse 29. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Verse 30, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus, and he will be very great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, Mary's first internal response to those words 
was she was confused and disturbed. The, that word literally means to agitate greatly or to trouble greatly. When an unexpected situation interrupts our life, we're often confused and disturbed. And immediately, most of us try and figure out, what does that mean? Did I, did I do something wrong? Why is this happening? What does this mean? In that moment of the angel's pronouncement, Mary's whole life was upended. Think about it. Her plans for the future, her path that she'd laid out for herself, the vision of her life that she had in that moment, it was all up for grabs. And I'm sure that she had thoughts of, what will people think? What will my parents do? What will Joseph do? Her peers would ridicule her. Her fiancé would consider leaving her. Have you ever been there? You're just going through life, and, and in a moment, everything changes. Is there peace in the middle of your mess? I know what it's like to have crisis interrupt my life. 21, almost 22 years ago, what began as a father-son ski trip ended in a rollover car accident that left my husband paralyzed from the mid-chest down. Our world of pastoring a church, raising our kids, our son Danny was 15, our daughter Anna was 12. Traveling the world on missions trips, my husband's athletic and musical gifts Suddenly, in, in a moment, in the blink of an eye, everything changed. Life as we knew it changed. In that moment, our lives, our children's lives, were turned upside down. After we received the phone call, my daughter and I were at home. We walked out of our tri-level home, and none of us ever spent another night there. Other people packed up all of our belongings Gary spent three months in the hospital. Our kids stayed with other people. I had to sell our home and buy another one before we could bring him home from the hospital and we could be together as a family again. We were filled with grief and pain and, and a world of unknowns. We had no idea what life would look like going forward. We had no plan for the, out of the mess we were in. It was as if a, a boulder landed in my path, in the middle of my path. I couldn't see around it. I couldn't see above it. I couldn't see under it. It completely blocked my view of anything in the future. I remember one particular day I was crying and singing a worship song because, honestly, I didn't know what else to do. And I sensed the Lord whisper to my heart, Lori, I want you to see this from my view. And for a moment, I saw this huge boulder in my path as a grain of sand. And even though I didn't know the way forward, God did. I've seen God's hand over and over again. His comfort when we grieved, even laughter in the pain, and gratefulness for His strength in my weakness. In the very hard, gut-wrenching circumstance, he gave me peace and assurance that he held me, he held my husband and my kids, and we would be okay. And I know if we had the opportunity, there are many that have stories of crisis, of tragedy in your own life and in the life of your loved ones. Because crisis, trouble, suffering, pain— is no respecter of persons. How then do we experience real God-given peace in the middle of turmoil? Let's look back at Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he'll be called the Son of God. And what's more, the angel said, 
Your relative, Elizabeth, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she's in her sixth month. Two things the angel tells Mary. God's going to overshadow you and do a miracle that you've never seen or heard of before. And the second thing, Elizabeth, your cousin, is miraculously expecting a baby also. In that little exchange between Gabriel and Mary, everything changed for Mary. She asked, how will it happen? What will happen in my my crisis? The Holy Spirit is going to do in you what you cannot do on your own. And he already did a miracle six months ago in Elizabeth. There's something powerful that happens when we see God at work, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of the people around us. It gives us hope and it builds our faith. We need community. And I know walking through our own hard seasons, I've been so grateful for the people that God has placed in our lives. In fact, just a few months ago in May of this year, Gary was very sick and and hospitalized in in Pleasanton, and we hadn't been here very long. We'd only been here a few months. But the community of our daughter and son-in-law took us in. They brought us meals and cards and flowers and, and prayed for us and loved us on us in the middle of our crisis. Friends, we need community. You need community. Back to Mary's story. The angel ends his announcement with these powerful words. I love this verse, verse 37. It says, for nothing is impossible with God. See, it's in our troubling circumstances that we give God the opportunity to show us that nothing is impossible with him. God can do the impossible any time, any day, in any way he chooses. There isn't anything that's too hard for God. There isn't any sin he can't forgive, any relationship he can't reconcile, any darkness he can't bring light to. There isn't any wound, any hurt, any betrayal that he can't heal. Your situation isn't too hopeless for him. And he can bring an impossible peace in the middle of your turmoil impossible peace in the middle of our turmoil. Can I be honest? I don't like tough times. I don't like crisis. But I have experienced impossible peace when the storm was raging around me, when I didn't have the answers, when I didn't know what was going to happen. Peace where I can say it is well with my soul. Mary's response still astounds me. Verse 38, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. So she goes from confused and disturbed, asking how can this be, to, okay, I'm God's servant. Yes, Lord. But what if Mary had said no? That's just way too difficult. See, I've had my life planned out, and that doesn't fit into my plans. Nope, I'm going to take a hard pass on that. Have you ever felt like that? I just want to skip over this trial, this difficulty. God, can you just remove this from me? Can we just skip over this one? There were lots of times that I said to God, I can't do this. This is too hard You picked the wrong girl. And then I would sense him whispering to my heart, telling me it would be okay. I will, he'll carry me. He'll do in me what I cannot do in myself. Can I tell you that peace in the middle of the storm is true peace? See, peace in the absence of trouble is just smooth sailing circumstances. Anyone can have peace when everything is going well. Where's the miracle in that? You and I cannot give peace to others or speak peace into a situation until we personally have experienced this peace for ourselves. 
long before the angel appeared to Mary, a prophet by the name of Micah had prophesied, had foretold about the Messiah. In Micah chapter 5, he says, Out of Bethlehem will come one who will rule over Israel. And in Micah 5.5, 5, he says of Jesus, And he will be our peace. Not bring peaceful situations. In fact, the context of this prophecy is it was during a time of war. But he, Jesus, will be our peace. Now, Mary would have heard about this one who is peace her entire life. In other words, Mary didn't know the how. She didn't even have anyone else she could ask, hey, what was it like when the Holy Spirit overshadowed you and you became pregnant? And maybe you feel like that, like there's no one who can really understand the situation you find yourself in or, or even the way you feel about it. Mary didn't know the how, but she knew the who. She knew the one who is peace. That's how she had peace in the midst, in the middle of all the unknowns in her life. The rest of the story goes on and Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And that beautiful moment when Elizabeth hears Mary's voice for the first time and the baby inside of her leaps. And Elizabeth begins to proclaim prophetically, how blessed Mary is, and that the baby she is carrying is blessed. And then Mary begins to proclaim her song of worship, her declaration of how her soul magnifies God and her spirit rejoices in Him. So the beginning of the story, Mary goes from her life being interrupted and filled with confusion to saying yes to God and experiencing His peace even when she didn't know how the future would turn out or what her life would look like. God hasn't changed my circumstances. He hasn't removed the obstacles. My husband is still in a wheelchair. And life is really hard at times, really hard. But I know the one who is peace, Jesus calms the storm in me. He reassures me that he's with me, that he won't ever leave me or forsake me. He is my peace, and he longs to be your peace. We're celebrating the season of gifts, and most of us have people that we give gifts to, and we receive gifts. And if someone gives me a beautifully wrapped gift— but I never open it or use it or experience what that gift is, then it's just a pretty box with a bow on it. Long before any of us were born, God gave us the greatest gift, Jesus. The bumps in our road, all the unexpected turn of circumstances, all the times that we were expecting one thing and something else happened— what if God was just disguising a gift? When my husband's accident happened, car accident happened over 21 years ago, I didn't see this interruption as a gift. I saw our lives take an unexpected turn. It wasn't pretty. This wasn't the way I pictured our lives turning out. But can I tell you that hidden in the wrapping of that ugly tragedy are some of the greatest blessings of my life. See, I've had a front row seat to watch how Jesus gives grace in affliction, strength in weakness, perseverance in pressure, joy even in difficulty, grit in trial, and great peace in pain. And He, Jesus, will be our peace. Jesus doesn't just want to give you peace. He wants to be your peace. The heart of Christmas is so much more than lights and music and the hustle bustle of the season. The heart of Christmas is this, that Jesus stepped down to pursue the broken and the hurting and the lost. And if you find yourself broken, grieving, or fearful, or hurt, I want you to know that 
You don't have to muster up cheer. You don't have to work up peace. You can just sit at the feet of a Savior that came for you right where you're at right now. See, that's how Emmanuel works. It's God with us in the dirt, giving us hope and peace in the face of despair. My prayer for us this Christmas season is that we, you and I, would experience Jesus as our peace in a personal and profound way. Can I pray for you? God, for every person that is hearing this at this moment, God, you know their situation, you know their their turmoil, their hurt, their pain. God, would you be their peace in the middle of that? Would you speak peace to every troubled soul, every hurting heart? And may every single person experience the greatest gift that they'll receive, Jesus being our peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Wait, wait, before you go, three things. First, please consider becoming one of Cornerstone Fellowship's financial partners. Your donations will ensure that you'll be able to continue enjoying helpful, hopefully life-changing messages like the one you just watched. And number two, please share the link to this message with anyone who you know needs it or will be blessed by it, or post the link to your own personal social platforms. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you'll be alerted whenever we post more content. Thanks for watching.